Recording in progress. Hello, once again, this is Dennis Drennan, and uh, this is the Shear Elective Series. We've been going through the uh, Ligonier uh, series, Dust to Glory, and today is number 38, Interpreting Parables. Jesus' parables often have an unexpected or surprise element in them. Most parables project a familiar world, but then introduce some radically different element, something unexpected. It is this surprise element that provokes a hearer into a re-examination re of his worldview, and thus which is the main point of the parable. Don McCartney and Charles Clayton. So we'll now turn to the video and hear what R.C. Sproul has to say about interpreting parables. One of my all-time favorite parables in the New Testament is Jesus' parable, usually called the parable of the prodigal son. Sometimes it's simply called the parable of the lost son. And its placement, where it is found in Luke's gospel, uh, raises some interesting questions initially about how the gospel writers put their material together in the first place. Because if you've noticed when you're reading through the gospels, when you have parallel accounts of teachings that Jesus gives, sometimes that teaching may take a setting in one geographical location in one of the Gospels, and it'll be somewhere else in the chronology in the other Gospel. And some critics raise their eyebrows about this and say, oh, obviously we can't trust the Bible because they have Jesus <coughs> teaching this same uh, principle in two different places. Well, in the first part, when the Synoptic Gospels were written, they were written by biblical writers who were not following the standard rules of chronology set forth by 20th century historical societies. Not that they weren't concerned with the truth of history, they were. But sometimes they uh, <clears throat> arranged the material of Jesus' teaching topically rather than chronologically. And different uh, gospel writers had different concerns of, of why they did it. Another point that needs to be brought out is, does anybody know any preacher or any professor who never repeats himself? I have to confess to you folks that I've given the same sermon on more than one occasion <laughs> in more than one place. And if, if you uh, are acquainted with the writings of contemporary scholars, people who have written many, many books, you may notice that they will frequently go over the same critical material in several different places. So that shouldn't be a problem that disturbs us. But as I said, my favorite parable is the parable of the prodigal son, I guess because I can identify with the prodigal son. And, but before we look at it, I want us to understand the context in which Luke gives it to us which is found in the 15th chapter of his gospel. Luke introduces this parable in this manner. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. But the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them perfect setting for this parable, because the sinners, the outcasts, the Amharats, the people of the earth, had gathered and flocked to hear Jesus. They hung on His every word. They made up this multitude that followed Him from village to village and heard Him gladly. But the professors, the theologians, the established clergy of Jesus' day. All of these people were severely threatened by the excellence and majesty of Christ, and they were constantly venting their spleens of jealousy and contempt for Christ. 
And so here's one of those encounters, one of those confrontations. I remember I said that one of the occasions for the setting of the parable is one of conflict and tension. And so at the same time, the sinners are hanging on every word that comes from the lips of Jesus. The scribes and the Pharisees are murmuring and complaining, who is this man who associates with sinners? And so instead of just saying, fellas, well, can we talk? I'd like to explain my mission and my agenda here that I'm trying to reach these people. I'm trying to, to minister the gospel to them. Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, he gives a series of parables. And so we read, So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he finds it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. For I say to you that there will be more joy in heaven <coughs> over the sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. There's been a great hymn written on the basis of this short parable called The Ninety and Nine. You know the hymn, the ninety and nine who safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but there was one lost sheep on that hill far away, far off from the streets of gold. And it tells the story of the pursuit of God to seek out that which is lost. I once heard my friend John Guest, involved in evangelistic crusade, speak about the change in the mentality of the church today from previous times when the church understood its mission to join with Christ to seek and to save the lost. And that's important. Jesus didn't say, I simply came to save the lost, but I came to seek them. He didn't just hang a sign up in front of his church and say, everybody's welcome to come and hear me preach. But he went out into the highways and byways and sought out the people who were the people in need and ministered to them. That was characteristic of Jesus' method of operation. Well, John Guest, when he was speaking about this, said that we have replaced the hymn the ninety and nine with a different hymn because we don't really even believe in evangelism anymore because we don't believe that anybody's lost. And even if we do believe that they're lost, we think that it's politically incorrect to go after them and search them, search for them. And he said the theme song today comes not so much from the pages of Scripture as it does from Mother Goose. Because now the anthem of the church is, leave them alone and they'll come home, wagging their tails behind them. And I, I, I don't think I'll ever forget the, uh, the significance of what John said there, that we forget that our Lord was profoundly concerned to go out and find the lost. Now, he continues with this short string of parables all with the same motif of what we do to find that which is valuable to us when it's lost, when the shepherd loses one of his sheep. That's not just a problem for the sheep, it's a problem for the shepherd. The sheep is valuable to the shepherd, and so he goes and pursues it. And then he tells the story, or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it. And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, <clears throat> I don't think Jesus is picking on women here, but he does set the stage, uh, the context of this parable by saying, what about what woman is there if she has ten coins and loses one of them? 
wouldn't light the lamp and search diligently to find it. Well, maybe there are women who wouldn't do that, but I'm not married to one like that. I'm married to one who is the most organized woman in all the world. In fact, our affectionate nickname for Vesta is Miss Tidy Ball. Some people are organized, some people are neat, fussy, some people are fastidious, but my wife is punctilious. There is a place for everything and everything in its place. Just one problem. She secures things so carefully that it's a never-ending thing in my house where she forgets where she put it. <laughs> and so the lights come on and the search begins. And every time this happens, I think of this parable that my wife proves the truth of the teaching of Jesus over and over again in her life. But you see the motif here is the quest for the lost, and it finds its zenith in the longest of these three parables here, in the parable of the lost son. Then he said, a certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. And so he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living." What a powerful description, and so succinct. Jesus could say so much with so few words. The simple little story of two sons, one of them is impatient, he wants his inheritance right now. And so he comes and he pursues his father, he said, let me have my inheritance. Let me use it as a grub stake to get started, to go out in the world. And so the father acquiesces and grants the wish of the son and gives him his inheritance in advance. And the first thing we're told about this young man is that he goes to a far country. How typical is that? How do young people behave on spring break when they get their first opportunity to get away from the watching eyes of authorities, of family, of teachers, and can be free for a week or a few days apart from somebody's careful observation. How do we behave when we are free from the restraints and constraints that our community puts upon us when we know that we have a reputation to maintain. And when people want to go and do bad things, they like to go where they're anonymous. And this fellow goes, and he goes to a far country, and we are told that he wastes his fortune in riotous living, a style of debauchery. For that which his father had labored so long to accumulate, he goes through like quicksilver. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And so he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country who sent him into his fields to feed swine. Do you see how poignant this is that Jesus, when he tells this story, doesn't have him going to tend flocks of sheep, but he is now forced to go take care of pigs. That has special significance to the Jew because the Jew understood the pig to be unclean. And this man now has gone from the life of a prince who had this luxurious amount of, uh, of wonderful life with, that was made available because of his inheritance. He goes through his inheritance. He had everything that he wanted. 
he, he sated his own desires and his appetites until he ran out of resources. And when he ran out of his resources, it just so happened that a famine came to the land. And he began to be in want. Why is it that it seems that the only time we want to hear a word from God is when we reach the bottom, when we reach the depths of despair? And in order to survive, this young man goes and hires himself out, basically as an indentured servant, working in a pig pen. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. His father had given him everything. And he despised the gifts of his father. And now he is coveting the slop that is being fed to the pigs. And no one will give him anything. Verse 17 is a powerful statement that Jesus makes here. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? It's interesting to me that, that in the history of the church, when God has visited his people with his spirit and has brought revival, that so often the language of a genuine revival is a language that uses words like awakening. We talk about the Great Awakening in America and the Second Great Awakening in this country. It says people have become torpid and they have fallen asleep to the things of God. And they have so repressed the truth of God and pushed God out of their thinking and out of their, their minds that even though they are biologically awake and conscious, they are unconscious to the things of God. But here we're told of the young man who comes to. See, before he came home, he had to first come to. He had to come to himself, as Jesus says. Now, I, I also want to add, parenthetically, I don't for a moment, think that he came to himself by himself. This is the ministry of the Holy Spirit to wake us up and to quicken us and to, to bring us from this uh, uh, deadly form of spiritual sleep in which we are held captive. But the boy comes to himself and he says, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. When I was back home, my father had servants, and now my servants have, far, or my father's servants have far more than I have. And he said, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. This almost sounds like a biographical sketch of David because it is such a poignant, vivid, graphic description of what genuine repentance is. Because first of all, he acknowledges his sin and he acknowledges against whom he has sinned. I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against my father. And I'm going to go home not to demand my birthright as a son to be a full member of the family, but I'm going home to confess my sin and to acknowledge that I am not worthy to even live under the roof of my father and beg to just be nearby as a servant. 
Beloved, nobody enters the kingdom of God until they understand this. This is what real repentance is. Not when you're just simply sorry for having been caught or having suffered the negative consequences of our guilt. But true repentance comes when we acknowledge we are not worthy to be included in our Father's house. And he said, I will arise and go to my Father. Now, notice that the first two little parables are all about the quest for that which was lost. And so far in this story, nobody's searching for this fellow. The Father is still at home. For all we can tell, the Father has no idea where his son is or what his son is doing. But he hasn't been searching for him. So where's the tie-in? So he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I remember once getting in trouble with my mother. And she called me into the house. She didn't come out to greet me. She didn't grab me by the ear. But I walked into the room, and she was standing there with her arms folded, and she was tapping her foot. Did you ever see somebody like that? They were waiting, and as soon as I saw that stance and that foot tapping, I knew I was in deep weeds and that I was about to get <clears throat> a king-size lecture. Now, I think if I would have been the prodigal father and I saw my son coming down the street, maybe I would have been tempted to stand there with a scowl on my face, waiting to see what the story was. That's not the way God is. That's not the way this father was. At the first sight of his son, how he recognized him would probably be through the idiosyncrasies of his walk. It certainly wouldn't have been by his clothes or by his facial appearance, as this kid had been living with pigs. He would have hardly been recognizable. But even at a distance, there was recognition. And as soon as the father saw him, he could tell that his son was in trouble because the father, we are told, had compassion. And what does the Bible say? So he carefully, deliberately took a step in the direction of his son. No, that's not the point at all, is it? ran down the road. His legs are flying. He falls upon his son. He embraces him. He hugs him. He kisses his neck. And he brings him into the house and gives the order, kill the fatted calf. He puts a ring on his hand, a turban on his head, and, and gives him all of the honors that could be bestowed upon an honorable son. He gives the son everything that the son doesn't deserve. Who are the Pharisees in this story? The younger brother sees that and say, hey, wait a minute. I never wasted my inheritance in profligate living. I didn't go out and embarrass you, violate you, sin against heaven. And you never had a celebration for me. He didn't get it, just like the Pharisees didn't get it. He said, this is your brother. This is my son. He once was lost, and now he's found. All of that to tell the Pharisees, yes, I associate with sinners because that's my mission. And if you love the Father, that would be your mission as well. Well, um, just want to say again, this is one of the uh, 
uh, recordings that uh, we're making separate from the actual Sunday school class. So we don't have the discussion. And I really, um, that that's uh, really something that uh, takes away from the whole uh, recording because the discussions are always uh, so good and uh, filled with a lot of good thought and uh, good, good folks who are uh, really striving to know, uh, know God better and really love the Bible. So with that, with that said, let's head off to our questions. The parables of Luke 15 are set within the context of Jesus' conflict with the Pharisees about associating with tax collectors and sinners. How do each of the three parables in Luke 15 contribute to the overarching theme of good news for outcasts? Well, of course, we have the uh, uh, we have the parable of the uh, uh, prodigal son, and we we have the lost coin. And let's look and see what is that third one. What is what is that that third one? parable of the lost sheep so um the idea of the good news for outcasts is this no matter which one of these parables we look at we see somebody that has gone out away from the uh status quo if you will gone away uh, the lost sheep, for example, was away from the rest of the flock. They had left the flock, and the shepherd went after them because that one sheep was so important that it had to be a part of the flock. So he went and got it. And, of course, the lost coin, any time we lose something of value, we want to find it. Um, several months ago, I had gone for an MRI. And unwittingly, I forgot uh, to leave my wedding ring at home. And I could not find it anywhere after I got home. And then I realized that I'd taken it off. I'd put it into the bag. I, I thought I put it in my pocket. But apparently, if I did, it came out of my pocket that was in the bag. And I threw the bag in the bin and never to be seen again. But I thought, how can I... Maybe I can find it. So I looked for it in different ways and um, and could not locate it. And so it's gone. I've also, uh, at, at another time, uh, it, it was gone. And I looked and looked and looked. I looked all over. I looked in the car. I looked everywhere I might have been with it. Could not find it. And uh, was really disappointed. And then I was at church one night and I was reaching into my uh backpack and i looked and there was something shiny in the bottom of the backpack and there it was and i was so happy to have found my wedding ring so all these things point to uh to somebody being brought back somebody who was gone and and uh and brought back uh even though they were outcasts and then of course the prodigal son gives up everything that he had at home, uh, all the luxuries, all the people serving him, uh, the, the, the things that, that go with being part of what we might call the aristocracy, the rich folks. And then he gave it up and he wound up blowing all the money that he had and he wound up having to uh, uh, live even as less than a servant. And so he wanted to come back to uh, his family. In the parable of the lost sheep, what, if anything, is the significance of the 99 sheep who need no repentance? Well, the idea here is that um, there were 99 that didn't need to be brought back. There were 99 that stayed in the flock and stayed where they were supposed to be. So the shepherd did not need 
to go after them. If, is Jesus saying that there are humans who do not have any need to repent? Not at all. We all need to repent. We all need to confess and repent uh, of our sins. Um, so humans still need to do that, even if we are, if you will, in the fold of Jesus. We still do not meet all the expectations that are there for us in keeping the law. Is he making a more subtle point about the difference between those who are obviously sinners and those who outwardly meet the standard of Scripture? Not sure about this one. I'm not sure if if that's what he's doing here, um, but he certainly is showing that there are uh, there are those that uh, don't need as much work <laughs> as others. So. Who is represented by the younger brother? The one, the younger brother is represented by those. He he represents those who uh, are willing to obey, are willing to spend their di days uh, doing the things that are uh, are are laid before them without any uh, real uh, resistance to them. And so the younger brother represents those that. Uh, are really part of what we would call the fold. And the older brother, I'm sorry, the younger brother, the younger brother is the one that is rebellious and wants to go off on his own. And uh, so uh, the younger brother's representing the um, uh, those that run from God who are are seeking other things. The older brother is the one that represents those who are satisfied to be where they are. They're pleased with where they are. They don't feel the need to uh, go off on some type of wild uh, experience, um, but they are, are, are uh, uh, happy to be where they are. And the father represents God, obviously. God the Father, and he represents him in a way that he loves both of his sons. He loves he loves them uh, uh, probably equally as well. So when the younger brother left, the father really considered him dead. He was gone. His father had no idea where he was, and so he just figured, you know, that he would never see him again. And then when he shows up, he is welcomed. He is welcomed with open arms. But the father still has another issue to deal with, and that's the older brother. How does the older brother now is really unhappy that his brother's getting all this attention and all these, you know, a banquet and all these things upon his return? And he says, I've, he says to his dad, I've done everything that you wanted me to. The father very uh, compassionately says, Look, your brother was gone. He, we thought he was dead, but he's alive. And so we are rejoicing in that. This parable addresses the problem expressed in Luke 15, 1 and 2 with the Pharisees. Uh, and let me read that to you. Now all the tax gatherers and sinners were coming near to him to listen to him. And both the Pharisees and scribes began to grumble, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. It addresses the problem and says, basically, Jesus came not to address those that are so-called righteous, but the ones that are sinners, and ones that know that they're sinners, that they acknowledge they're sinners. Um, the Pharisees did not want to acknowledge that. They thought they were righteous beyond uh, beyond exception. What is the difference between the attitudes of the father and the older brother, respectively, towards the younger brother's repentance? Well, we've mentioned that uh, already. Um, the father is just excited to have his younger uh, son 
back with him. He is he is he is uh, 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 overwhelmed with with emotion upon the return of his younger uh, younger son. But the older brother, on the other hand, is actually showing jealousy as he is saying to the father, look, I look at all these things that I've done. Look what I've done. I've stayed here. I've worked with you. I've uh, done those things that you wanted me to. And here's here's my older brother or my younger brother coming. And he has done none of this. He actually pretty much uh, slapped you in the face by leaving and taking his inheritance. And look, look, look what what he's doing. And the attitude of the father was, look, I am so happy that my son is alive, that he's returned, and we can now fellowship again together. This shows that uh, Jesus was using this story to invite the Pharisees to adopt God's attitude toward the repentant. He's telling the Pharisees that those who are repentant need to be respected for that. They need to have uh, the uh, those that are uh, not, not necessarily needing repentance because they're keeping laws, they're doing the things, but those people need to understand that God's attitude towards the repentant is rejoicing. There's a scripture that says, for one who turns from their sins, there is great rejoicing in heaven. And that's because not only is God excited about it, but all of heaven rejoices when one turns from their sins. How did the biblical arra writers arrange the historical matter in their writings? Was it chronologically, topically, liturgically, or arbitrarily? It was topically. They arranged things topically. You'll find that there's there's different things that happen that uh, are not in a chronological order necessarily in their writings. What group of people hung on every word of Jesus? The tax collectors and the sinners. What was characteristic of Jesus' ministry? A, he, he actively searched people out. B, he waited for people to come to him. C, he had his disciples bring people to him. D, he sent his disciples to search out the lost. It's A, Jesus went and actively searched people out. In Luke 15, Jesus' telling of three parables culminates in which parable? The parable of the lost sheep, A. Or B, the parable of the lost coin. C, the parable of the pearl of great price. Or D, the parable of the lost, uh, uh, the parable of the prodigal son. And it is the parable of the prodigal son. In the parable of the prodigal son, what animal does the younger son care for that would have been considered unclean by the Jews? Was it camels, rock badgers, shellfish? Or pigs? Well, we know that it was pigs because um, uh, pork was something that was forbidden for the Jews to eat or even probably to touch. In the parable of the prodigal son, who does the older brother represent in the parable? The tax collectors, the Pharisees, the nation of Israel, or sinners? It was the Pharisees. And so that brings us to the end of uh, interpreting uh, uh, parables. And the next one that we will be heading to in the series will be uh, number 39, the miracles of Jesus. So we will head to those uh, in the next session. Thank you. And if you uh, would like to subscribe, please do so as you can subscribe to this, to my channel. Um, if you would like to be a part of the Zoom classes, you can email me at dr 
D-R-E-N-N-E-N. -E -N -E -N. Yes, that looks like Dr. Drennan at Gmail, Dr. Drennan at gmail.com. Uh, and I will send you the link to be able to tune in on Sunday mornings at 9.30 a.m. Thank you, and you have a great day.